Welcome back, my friends, to the sweet spot where IT leaders share the insights with other leaders and others who want to lead. My name is Carlos Vargas, and in every week, I have my two co hosts, Howard Holton and Paul Lewis. Hey, guys. Carlos, hey happy Monday. Happy Monday. <laughs> See, now you've let people know that we record on Mondays. No, we release on Monday. I didn't let them know anything. We release on Monday. <laughs> That's right. So as far as you know, it's going to be Sunday morning. Live. Live. You're seeing it live as we, we're re recording. Oh, that's right. Coming to you live from the, the recent past. <laughs> <laughs> Has been a wonderful week. Um, any new snow where you guys are? Nope. Or it rained the entire time. I, since our last conversation, it's rained till now. <laughs> wow. We've lost every well, bit of snow. It doesn't exist. And now I have two dogs coming in from outside and we're we're uh we're wiping them down, paws and everything, just to make sure they don't make a mess of the house. Do we need to send a boat to pick you up? <laughs> Not me. Our previous guests would need a boat, but I'm I'm on the escarpment, we're fine. <laughs> and nope, it's been dry here. I still have snow on my roof because you know I've got a north-facing house, so my garage never melts. But otherwise, yeah, it's good. It's been cool here in Florida, so I don't know what you guys are dealing over there. It's cool. We were on the beach this weekend. Warm, good weather. Yeah. What do you consider cool? Seventies. <laughs> was around eighty-five-ish. I see. But the water was cool, so you can dive in. You don't have to get burned, anything like that. No. Yep. So 80, 85 is kind of the top end of temperatures I enjoyed anyways. <laughs> right. So I don't know that I would consider that cool. cool. Like 87 starts to get a little warm for me. Cool. Let's see. Here it's been, I think yesterday's high was 36 degrees Fahrenheit. So I don't know what that is. Negative 700 or 35. I don't know what that is. Give or take. You were so, it's somewhere in between there. Who decided that policy, Howard? That was 87 degrees. <laughs> uh, I did. I, did. I, I decided that, that 87 degrees is my top temperature. I didn't, it's not a policy. I didn't set it for the entirety of the world. I tried, but nobody listened. <laughs> Today's topic. Could someone that is very gifted in an area should be making policies? Should I think <laughs> in IT? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, I think the question really directly is: Should engineers also set policy? Right. right? And I think also is a, a a good term there. So, so Paul, I think you have some thoughts on that. Why don't you start us off? I'm I'm probably a little bit more binary in this question. So, so if you look at IT, operating IT, there's um, there's decisions that have to be made, um, and there's work that has to be completed, right? So, uh, work that has completed on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, fingers on keyboard, uh, creating resources, removing resources, updating resources, uh, making resources secure all well and good stuff. There's administrative functions, there's engineering functions, there's architectural functions, but there's the execution of IT work. Uh, then of course, there's the uh, decision-making process that in many ways is policy-centric. I'm not saying real-time decisions on whether I should uh, uh, you know, perform this function or that function in whatever order you wanna do them in, or uh, you know, 17 steps on the run book you know, which types of people should do which kind of steps. I'm talking about sort of the grander type conversation. Uh, which technologies should I choose? Which architectures make sense? Uh, which vendors uh, should I align with? With what products should I buy? What, uh, what are the, what's the, what's the end goal? Uh, what's the strategy? And what are the waypoints to get to that point? In many ways, those are more of a policy-based conversation versus an execution-based conversation. And my general MO was uh, to have policy-based conversations more at the executive level, right? 
where I require input from administration and engineering um, and architecture. However, because those decisions often require top-down decision-making like financial constraints or partner constraints or political uh, problems, both externally and externally, or shareholder value or impact, uh, or just the perspectives and experience and grizzled veteranship of a variety of executives, that policy gets decided at that level instead of the execution level. I'm kind of I'm kind of binary at that perspective. I don't know. Maybe it's just my experience. But Howard, what do you what do you think of that? I think it's much more like the operation of a yo-yo. Okay. Okay. I think strategy has to be decided at the executive level, right? Our strategy is we're moving to a utility-based cloud model, right? Yo-yo goes down to the execution level where we look at what are we actually running, because at the executive level, you probably don't know, and what, what of the available products that fit that definition make the most sense. We're gonna go with Microsoft Azure, because we're a Microsoft shop, and Microsoft does a really good job of pricing and aligning with the things that we need. Or um, we do a lot of custom app dev, uh, we've got scalability um, challenges, and we're going to need a lot of DevOps engineers. AWS makes more sense simply because their penetration is higher, and therefore we can get more people. Or Google Cloud offers an application that we've been looking at and, and need, so Google Cloud's the thing. Yo-Yo goes back up to the top, right, carrying along that information, and then the top looks at that and says, okay, well, um, we can't do Google Cloud because we have a conflict of interest with um, – you know, so and so, or none of our part, all of our partners are aligned to Azure, or um, there's a political issue with, you know, long term pricing or whatever, you know, whatever that happens to be in the decision is made, right? And, but again, I think the yo yo goes back down and says, okay, well, these are the considerations we have. We've narrowed it down to one of these two, right? And I, I think it's much more of a yo yo, a yo yo decision style. Um, for kind of those major decisions. Now, I think there's a big difference between policy and execution, mm -hmm. right? Policy doesn't generally specify technology. So kind of, you know, um, when we're talking about, let's say we're talking about backup, right? I'm not gonna create a policy that says we're gonna use Commvault, not generally. I'm right. going to create a policy that says um, the following backup structure is in place. These are the the kind of levels, this is the RPO, RTO, this is the matrix that we're using, the following features must be supported, we must be able to accomplish the following business objectives, and then I'm going to send that, send that both down and out and see, you know, this is, this is kind of the, the RF, RFI, RFP kind of situation that we're setting up inside the organization, not generally making the decision. At the same time, I, I kind of agree that engineers shouldn't be the ones making the decision, but I don't think there's any one person that makes the decision anyhow. Um, yeah, I, if we're talking about absolute decisions, maybe, right? Choose this product, choose this vendor, choose this whatever, but, but policy could add the appropriate constraints that narrow that down, right? So if I'm choosing a cloud, if I'm making a cloud decision, um, I will create a constraint that ensures that only three vendors could possibly make that list, right? It has to be an organization that's been doing it for the last seven years uh, and they have to earn this kind of revenue. Okay, well, that's already narrowed the list dramatically beyond what a niche provider that, that might be local to your, to your city or state, right? Um, but, uh, and I think part of the policies that the executive set would create would include those absolute constraints, even if it doesn't make the absolute decisions. Um, I would perceive, though, that cloud in general, regardless of product or price or blockchain or architectural style, uh, would still fall in the policy category and that we wouldn't have engineers de determining uh, whether we go to cloud or not. Uh, engineers would determine how we would go to the cloud that they may ultimately choose the vendor of, as an example. I, I, think, that's, I think that's generally a truism, yeah. But I think there's also a problem. Sorry. No, like who will provide that supporting structure so you can make those decisions? Because you said you're talking about making those decisions 
up in the chain who will help you make those decisions so you can go there. So I had a, um, I'm going to refer to it in general as a policy team. So in general, there was a technological forum to which created policy. That technological forum included, you know, the director of architecture. And that architecture was infrastructure, applications, data, and security. That's what they represented. Uh, so they created policy that would lean the direction of a particular technology um, style. Uh, then there was a security team that determined what the security constraints might be. And then I had a financial person assigned in that group that essentially said, here are the financial both dollar and timing constraints of this kind of decision making. Then the actual policy or not even the absolute decision, just the policy or direction came from that team that went down to the execution. It, w it wasn't the you know, the CIO leadership conference, it was a distinctly different team that made that policy. And sometimes it was a PMO team, right? So if it was a project sensitive sort of policy they were implementing, like what style of delivery were they doing, waterfall versus agile? I don't know, Howard, so, did, you, did you have something that formal or something less formal? Uh, I, I mean, I, I've always either had or been part of the steering committees. Right. Right, um, where it's effective, is in the ideation phase, not the post decision phase, mm. right? So, um, hey, we're thinking about going to cloud. What what are the uh, implications of us going to cloud? Steering committee come back to me with all of the implications based on your particular field of expertise, mm. right? <clears throat> then you can do kind of a cost benefit analysis and determine you know what makes sense for the organization. In, in that case. Um, I, I think it works great. The other way around where it's, we're going to cloud, make it so, right? Kind of the, the, the Commander Picard version. I'm right. not sure that's actually smart, effective, or should ever be done in any case ever, right? <laughs> because ultimately, you know, that's where we get into situations where we see like the California um, uh, hospital network that said they're, uh, their expected next year annual Azure spend will exceed their expected revenues. Right. Right. Because frankly, um, cloud is a really, really, really good place to take advantage of things that are hard to do on premise. By which I mean, it's hard to convert to a fully DevOps CICD infrastructure as code model by flipping a light switch. Well, the cloud is natively built for that thing, right? And so one place where, where it makes sense to kind of do that is um, our infrastructure is not designed for it. In order to do that, we need a lot of overlapping infrastructure. Let's push some things to the cloud and start doing that kind of migration and really get our, for lack of a better term, DevOps strategy figured out. Right. Right. Cool. What's it going to take to do DevOps? So we can't just fl flip a light switch even for that. Right. So if we think about it that way and we kind of talk through, you know, this is where we're going. This is how cloud fits in. This is why cloud is a smart strategy. And these are all the steps necessary to do that properly. Right. The investments we have to make even before we, we flip the light switch. Um, but I think it works really well. If it's the other way around, you know, what happens is you just do a lift and shift. And a lift and shift is really expensive. Mm -hmm. And I gain none of the value of the cloud. I'm just paying someone else to run my data center. And you know what they're doing? They're marking it up for me. It's very nice of them, right? The value to cloud is in taking advantage of the cloud mechanics, right? Having your people run operations differently by taking advantage of the things the cloud offers. Just doing the same thing in someone else's data center isn't, isn't generally going to be cheaper. Right? So of everything you said, what was policy that you'd expect either the steering committee or the CIO leadership to make and what would be execution level decision making? Well, what I, what I would expect, again, is right here's the question. We need a cloud strategy. What's a cloud strategy that makes sense for us knowing we want to get to a fully agile DevOps environment? And the cloud seems built for that, right? And so then I would expect to take that to the steering committee. We don't have a policy at this point, right? They're not figuring out how to execute the policy. They're doing a cost benefit analysis on that policy and what the policy should look look like, right? So the, infra the head of infrastructure on that steering committee looks at it and goes, okay, well, um, in order to do that, the following seven things need to be changed in operations. 
Um, three of them are relatively easy for us to do, right? We're, we're basically changing workflows that show where we point for things. Uh, the other four require some sort of setup and lead up. That, that lead up is going to take 12 months and cost $86,000 per team over the course of those 12 months to do training, whatever it happens to be, right? Um, we lack the tools, we lack the expertise, we lack the capabilities to, to do this properly. Um, the finance is going to look at it and go, well, this is the contracts that we're currently in for the equipment we have. This is our write downs. This is our amortization tables, right? Switching all of that out is going to cost us why, right? Maybe we do a phased approach, right? Um, so, so it's kind of that that I expect. And then they come back and they, they reach down into the organization as far as they need to. But I don't expect a VP of infrastructure to really understand how many people they have on staff that can write Python, how right. many people they have on staff that understand as the percentage of the total staff that understand cloud native, how many certifications they have, that sort of stuff, right? Um, at the same time, I don't think technologists should choose products. I think almost never should technologists choose products as a matter of policy, mm. right? We need, our, our backups don't work, we need new backups. Having the technologists write the policy, I don't generally think is a good idea. Technologists tend to be, and I count myself in that group, tend to be a little too enamored with the specific technology right. for the sake of the specific technology, right? Um, right. And I think, I think the bookends of the conversation both have the same trouble, right? Um, a CIO arbitrarily declaring everything will be put on blockchain or a board declaring everything will be put on blockchain. I think right. has the same danger as an engineer saying blockchain is really cool. Everything we put on blockchain, right? Right. They have different motivations, but I think that I think what they accomplish is the same amount of of chaos, terror, and damage, right? And in reality, those decisions really need to come to some sort of central central point, whose job it is is to is to look at kind of the many facets of those type of decisions and determine what's right for the organization, and inform the executive or executive executives what the policy should look like as it makes sense to the organization mm. I, get, I guess I uh, you know I started by saying policy versus execution I think I might augment that in real time and say it's probably three levels I think it's strategy policy and execution so uh, senior executives CIO CTO CISO creating strategy right Here's the direction I need you to go. Here's an endpoint that I think is valid today. Might not be valid six months from now, but it's valid today. Here are the waypoints that I want to be able to measure you on over time. Maybe it's quarterly, maybe it's monthly. Uh, make it so. And my, make it so doesn't mean make it true. Make it so is saying, here's the strategy I want you to undertake. Go to the next level. Next level being policy. Right? Policy is the steering team, as exactly as you described. However, I'd probably be a little bit more generic to it. So let's say the technology steering team, now that they've received their words of cloud is what you need to do, they're going to create the appropriate business cases as you described, but a little bit more generic. So it's not the, uh, what's the cost of deploying to Azure, it's what's the range of costs and how it's gonna change if I move from on-premise to cloud, knowing that there are price differences between vendors. It almost doesn't matter at that point but show me the difference between the operating model between the two. And then in general, sure. what is the execution path? Not what the execution steps are, but how would one shift from where we are now to where we need to be, almost like a roadmap, if one were to describe it. It would be the roadmap versus the waypoint. Um, and then finally, once policy is created, and that policy just might just be another word for direction, uh, uh, then it goes to the execution side to say, okay, well, how does one actually do it? What kind of physical decisions that I need to make? Am I picking X, Y, or Z? What are the detailed requirements I need to implement, the non-functional requirements, the, and then let me compare the products and offerings and then ultimately make a decision and execute. That, that's kind of the three layers I, feel, I, I would see that are distinctly different. Sure. Uh, yeah, okay. I, I agree with within the context of I need enough detail in the policy step that my budgetary information isn't off by more than 10%. Right. Right, like that's a really critical piece to it, and and it becomes you know the the more kind of small in scope the the policy is, the easier it's going to be to to get the dart close to the bullseye on pricing, right, on budgetary kind of undertaking. Um, 
where what are the what are the right factors now. that make it different between orders of magnitude difference and ten percent difference? Um, capabilities that I already have. Okay, so my right. my intimate knowledge of the thing we're talking about at the moment. Absolutely, right. Absolutely, it makes a tremendous difference, and like how the business aligns to the thing. Right. Right, because I do see it. I see a quite a drastic difference in Azure versus AWS versus Google Cloud versus OT Cloud provider. Right, and kind of on and on and on. In terms of value execution cost. Execution cost. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, everything from um, I might actually get better pricing for for exactly what I want to run from a OT provider. That is entirely possible. Right. Right. But then I have to weigh what is my rate of loss amongst employees, right? Um, how many time, how many people am I going to have to train to that use case, to that technology, um, versus how many can I purchase that come along with AWS? How many can I purchase that come along with Azure? How many can I purchase that come along with Google Cloud? Um, and I think all of those really start to become factors that that can get very expensive, right? Um, it's very cheap to train train it. A team of eight to do a proof of concept. Right. It's very complex to train a team of five hundred to do enduring support. Right, right, and and so you know a small variance in in training cost can add up to a to an overwhelming amount, especially considering you know the various. Not everyone learns the same way, and so it may make it may make sense initially to to take a kind of a tiger team. Um, and do things like Udemy, right? Do things that are more kind of self-paced, self-taught, so that you can get stuff built. But that's not going to give it, give you an accurate reflection of what it's going to take to get, you know, uh, someone with a year of experience that's just been moved into sysadmin um, up to the speed that they're going to need to be to continue to kind of understand, manage, and monitor this stuff. Yeah, I can buy that your current capability or currently current competence to determine how well your policy. Will be created. So there's a distinct difference between agile application development and or cloud, and then and or edge, and then AIML, and then quantum computing. Like the further you get on the um, you know ingenuity scale of technology, the less likelihood that you actually have any capability on that topic per se. So if you've decided as a CIO, quantum computing is the way to go. You likely have exactly zero expertise and ex and experience, and therefore every, everything you're saying is a guess. Sure, uh, and I think it also depends too on on how impactful the technology is to the organization. Right, right, because you could easily decide today um, quantum computing is the future, and you can fund it with six people, four right. people, two people, and probably and that's probably going to be effective. Based on your current maturity, based on your current capabilities, and based on the current kind of market value of that decision, mm -hmm. and I think that's again, right? I'm just going to use cloud as an example. I think that's drastically different than saying we're no longer doing on-prem; we're doing cloud, right? Right? Because that's a, that's going to impact every single person in IT operations, all of them, all the way through. Right? right. You can't adequately do tech support not understanding where your desktop users are now connecting to it. Right. So everyone has to be retrained, right? Um, and the longer it's been since the last change, right, the, the the lower your rate of change amongst all those groups, the harder it's going to be, and more expensive it's going to be to break that, make that change, right? You have to knock the calcification off, kind of the the standard operating model. And if your standard operating model is we do things the way we did them yesterday, I think I think you're 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 going to be in for a, a more expensive, longer road than. Um, we have no standard operating model. Our standard operating model is not standard simply because we are we are constantly changing and evolving, and thus the elasticity within the organization is really high. How do you feel about policy absolutism? So, so as an example, policy absolutism would be cloud only versus uh, a policy prioritization mechanism would be, okay, we're going to do cloud first, and then SaaS second, and then build third. What, what, how do you, what do you think about either one of those two, absolutism or prioritization? Um, I think, I think everything has an asterisk, <laughs> right? 
Um, there are some things that will never be cheaper to do yourself in the cloud, in whatever your cloud is, right? AWS, Azure, Google, Boutique, five of them, it doesn't matter. There are some things that are simply going to be too complicated, right? SaaS is a far better model for a lot of things today. On-prem may be a better model as well, right? If you're a heavy mainframe shop, I can't conceive of a, of a, of a current space right now where it is going to be cheap in the short term to move to cloud. Right. And therefore cloud first, I don't think, or cloud only, I don't think makes a whole lot of sense. No, Unless no, that startup. application's yeah. far better for mainframe. Far, far better for mainframe. Okay, but we have a cloud only, so you're gonna have to design it for the cloud. Yeah, but it doesn't talk to any of the data sets that are on the mainframe yet. We haven't got to that point. I understand, but our policy is cloud only. <laughs> right. Right. Um, and and then on the other on the kind of flip side to that, um, cloud only as a policy, right? An, an absolutism as a policy is supposed to say, um, even if it's a little painful, we want to move to the future, not to the past. Mm -hmm. And so often, what I see in a first style model, which I which I genuinely prefer, but a lot of times what I see is, well, we checked a box, we looked at cloud, we decided it was more, it was less expensive to do it another way. Well, all you're doing in that case, oftentimes, is sliding the time frame that you're going to have to move it there anyways. Right. Right. And so I think, I, I think if cloud first is a genuine, we must pursue cloud first, and only if we determine cloud will not work, or is you know like there's three conditions, and and those conditions are harsh conditions. Um, then we look at next order of operations, then next order of operations, then next order of operations with, frankly, with the way we used to do it being dead last, absolute unequivocal dead last. Um, then I think it just becomes a checkbox. And we want to avoid checkbox, checkbox decisions because um, ultimately we're too much, it's too much like Congress, right? You get deadlocked and it just becomes the next guy's problem as you, as you, uh, you know, slide the hockey puck along. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that absolutism rarely is absolutism, right? It's 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 you, it's only because you want a pretty hard break between that and the next decision, <laughs> where where all else has to be true for you to actually move to the next level, where it's not in fact cloud, or it's not in fact this architectural style, or it's not in fact you know agile development, where I actually have to go back to waterfall development because of this absolute reason. Yeah, and, and I, I also like I also think absolutism from a um, technology decision is is generally poor anyhow. Mm -hmm. Cloud isn't always right for everything. Right. Right. One backup system isn't always right for everything. One automation system isn't always right for everything. Right. Saying we're going all serverless or we're going all, you know, pick it, it kind of doesn't matter. Right. Um, you need to have the flexibility to say, we're not standardizing on everything, right? You can't just choose from everything, but it, it logically makes sense that we have a, an option A, option B scenario in nearly every case. Because um, it's very, very rare that you can say, you know, MongoDB is right for every single data source, period. Right. And sometimes actually SQL works great. Right, some version of SQL works great. Sometimes you know you can't say containers for everything. Sometimes serverless is the right choice. Sometimes a traditional VM is the right choice. Sometimes mainframe is the right choice, right? Um, and so you really need to kind of work through, you know, what does your organization look like, and if you're going to put together a policy, what what makes sense, and really what allows for the future? Like, holy crap, um, we generally get into absolutism because what we did in the past we clung to entirely too long. And it put us far on our back foot when it came time to change. And we're trying to avoid that in the future, but, but absolutism generally just sets us up for doing exactly the same thing in the future. Right? What happens when the cost of cloud increases? Right? What happens when, you know, insert, what happens when AWS has a, a you know, a 12 hour outage like they did the other day? Um, does that work for the organization? Right? And then how quickly can we adopt our policy if it took us nine months to come up with a policy to begin with? What, how quickly can we can we adopt a new policy that makes more sense as we learn and educate? So it seems like since technology is changing far quicker today than it ever has been before, and we can only assume that will increase over time versus decrease over time, that IT is kind of setting itself up for failure. Because realistically, over time, 
it's quite possible that every policy and every execution will be based on capability you don't have. So how do you recognize as a CIO or CTO or even part of the policy team or even part of the execution team to know or appreciate that you don't in fact have that expertise and capability before you make that decision? Let's say that quantum is real as a real example. It's real, it's real enough that I could consume it uh, in a productionized um, you know, commercial way. Um, I don't have any of that capability but it just came upon me next week. How do, how do I know that I don't know? And then so, how do how does a CIO set set him hit him or herself up to to have that knowledge? So I think that's actually uh, I think that goes back to your mission statement and values even before your strategy, right? If uh, agility and innovation isn't part of your mission statement and, and values, you're probably not going to get there, right? Um, and and that, that doesn't mean you're not, but by, by making those part of your mission statement or values and or values, right? Then you're you're forcing the creation of a culture that values those two things, right? Um, and then everything that I do, whether it's strategy, policy, or execution, starts with what is my culture, uh, what are my mission, and what is my values, right? And so I can look at everything and go, okay, well, this is a bad strategy because it, it neither... Um, focuses on innovation nor agility. It doesn't allow for those things, therefore I need to rewrite my strategy. Okay, cool, here's the strategy. The policy needs to be redone because it doesn't keep innovation and agility at its core, right? And then, and it gives you kind of the roadmap to look at look through those things. You don't even have to look outside yourself, right? From an execution standpoint. Okay, cool, we've, we've now chosen a tool. We're now gonna start writing to that tool is this the right way to write to it? Is this the right way to execute? Is this the right way to build? No, because I've tied myself to one thing that's incredibly proprietary and I've done nothing to ensure that I can innovate or be agile. And when it comes to things like quantum, part of that also has to be, you need to have an innovation team. You need to have a group of people whose job it is and are funded to do, to look forward, to look ahead, to see not just how is that technology and is that technology viable, but how would that technology alter my, the market in which, to which I serve, mm -hmm. right? Quantum is a fantastic example. I don't think anybody, I don't think anybody in business today, right? Outside of research can adequately say how quantum, how drastically quantum is going to affect the business, right? right? Um, so I don't think anybody could steer you correctly. But I think the worst thing you can do is ignore it and put your head in the sand because something as disruptive as quantum has the ability to, to disrupt everything um, and give your competition such an enormous leg up that you need to not be caught unawares, right? You may not want to invest in quantum computing yet. You may have determined now is not the right time to dump, I don't know how many millions of dollars it would take into quantum. But you should have an innovation team that's currently looking at quantum, that's been looking at Bitcoin, or sorry, blockchain, that's, that, that you know, helps steer your cloud or you know, the, those really critical, really disruptive decisions that are going to be made internally, you should have an innovation team that looks at those things. And yeah, you, you really say this all the time. In fact, you know, you're constantly talking about that every technology team should be a product team, right? Every technology, every company should be organized like they're a product organization and therefore have roadmaps and likely have a, a market intelligence team, right? So they can create battle cards in many ways. And the reality is that innovation team might be that team that not only does proof of concepts and applicability of technology, but also is the raw intelligence gatherer. It's almost like it's creating the presidential da uh, a daily brief, right? The PDB and that PDB goes to the CIO and CTO saying, by the way, Here's the out, outside of my organization knowledge, technology innovation, Gartner, and like all the content you're going to get from research houses. Here's how or the appropriate applicability are within our organization. It's not a strategy. It's not a policy. It's simply raw intelligence. Now, you as an executive, do you want to create strategy from it? Are you seeing something over the last days, over the last weeks that you might think to yourself, I now need to apply this. From that comes strategy. 
And, and I would think part of it probably needs to be a thumbs up, thumbs down on should we have a strategy. Right. Right. It, it also needs to, if, if, you know, we're really talking kind of, kind of greenfield pie in the sky, um, some piece of it needs to include legislative input. Right. As in, this is the current pace of legislation, the current flavor, the current appetite for legislation in this area. Right. Um, I think we need to have a policy that takes into consideration what GDPR would look like here in our jurisdiction because right. it is common. kind of those things right also need right. to be taken into consideration so um you know not only technology but but really the the external factors that affects technology right. and i think that's really i think that stuff becomes really really important and really valuable yeah like like not only not only technological innovation and legislative changes and of course um sort of macro economic and or cultural changes like pandemic right so all of those factors have to to, yep. to determine what how it, it might affect strategy going forward. And in many ways, you need that team, that innovation team, to not just apply it, but actually do the appropriate research and narrow it down. Because it could be thousands of different things that don't apply at all, or are so far in the future doesn't matter. Narrow it down to things that might matter in 24 months or 36 month periods. Right. And that's hard. Yeah. That is a capability you probably don't have. It's a capability you probably need to bring in. Yeah, and, and it's capability that is going to be complex. Yeah. Right. And it is capability that's going to be expensive, and it's capability that has no ROI. Right. Right. I mean, the reality is if you're going to try to measure based on ROI, it's eight years of ROI before you <laughs> before you're able to to really truly measure or see, but that's actually the point. Right. Right. Because how, you can't measure backwards and say, well, we would have made bad decisions, but we had this team that steered us away from things we would have dumped millions of dollars into. Right? Right. It's very hard to do when you're being informed by a team that prevents those decisions or mitigates those decisions from ever even bobbling to the surface where, where they could be measured. And it doesn't exist. Like I can't go to any one vendor right now to, to, to subscribe to content that allows me to, to apply it to my business. It, it's not possible, right? I could subscribe to all the analyst firms and I'm going to get a whole bunch of different opinions, uh, but it's still not coming back to how I need to actually operate IT. How do I need to lead sort of internal or commercialized products for the purpose of internal audience and external audience? The, that, that translation between market analysis and applicability doesn't exist outside, or at least none that I'm aware of. Yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of it either. And, and it's part of the challenge with HBR with Gartner, with with IDC, with all of them, um, Accenture, right? Um, all, all of them is market insight is great, but without the applicability to my specific organization, my specific business, my specific place, time, and capabilities, it loses. It, it really loses all of its value. It should right. be informational, not actionable. Right. And I think too often it's changed from informational to actionable. Right. What would be then what a leader need to be paying attention to put or take all that information that you guys have shared to then start making decisions inside? What would be like a step one, step two, step three? Uh, because I, I have seen both sides. Like you said, some people may take some information and start creating policies. Sometimes engineers are coming from the bottom up because they think that they know and they their influence over the organization then affect how the policies are set. What would be something that the leaders that are listening to us can apply what you're saying? Uh, honestly, I'd start by creating an information, an innovation forum, right? Um, it can it can be as simple as a, a, one or two people in charge of it, and a a a, a room on Slack or room on Teams, right? Um, a way for people to bubble up their thoughts around innovation. We should do this. We should pay attention to this. We should be looking at this. Why don't we have a policy for this? Why aren't we doing this? Right. So that stuff can get up to one or two people right now that are really in charge of forward thinking innovation and all and 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 just start just seriously set the bar low 
set the bar really low and just go, what are the top three innovations we need to be looking at in the next 12 months? So just start there. Right. Yep, and having, information on having an obvious communication channel, as Howard was saying, right? It can't. It's not just making it available, but encouraged to have that communication. I want to hear from you. You are going to list everything that you think we're missing on, and even if it's current day, we're missing a current policy on on whether employees should be able to post on social media. Great. Let's get that down let's document it i will endeavor to create a policy and or a strategy on it but of the things that aren't necessarily readily available and we have to actually do you know market intelligence and research on i need to know that too because we need to be prepared because everybody here knows more about technology at least on the execution side than i do in the executive and make sure that the information bubbles up bubbles down through the organization right Right. So the CEO should get a report, the, C, the C-level, right, should get a report every week on the kind of top innovation news within the organization. And then the, the actions that are taken from that should be propagated through the organization. Celebrate them as though they are wins. It right. was suggested that a better work from home policy needed to be created because our work from home policy was weak because we really only had 3% work from home. The right. new... That innovation came, that, that idea came through our innovation channel. The innovation team looked at it, a committee was formed and executed on it quickly. And here's the results of it. Here's the new policy is attached. Right. Right. Celebrate each one of those as though they are wins. We are now looking at quantum computing. In looking at quantum computing, we have determined that within the retail space, we think the viability is five plus years out. Um, and so while, while we find quantum computing will be absolutely revolutionary to our industry, we're unsure where to go from for now and we have higher priorities. Cool, moving on, right? Celebrate each and every one of those things, but make sure that they get telegraphed throughout the organization um, because the morale value to that will be enormous and it will, there's no better way to encourage people to actually use it. Um, and you're gonna stumble on things that you'll actually be able to take advantage of and be ahead of the competition on simply by listening. Right? Crowdsourcing your employees to provide innovation is a fantastic way to do it. And, you know, gamify it, reward it. Right? If you do something, if you put it into play, then based on the value of the innovation, give some sort of reward, give some, some sort of celebration. Right? You come up with a new work from home policy, that sounds like a, a nice, you know, night out reward. You come up with, you know, you get turned on to some new technology that that you know saves half a million dollars a year. That sounds like a you know a, I, I don't know a better reward. And have that person be involved in the actual innovation execution. It's not just the ideation. You're now added to the team. You're now involved in making this real. Hundred percent. If it's your idea, you should have some ownership of it. Right. Because again, that's going to do nothing but improve morale. You don't, they don't, like, it doesn't mean they lead the team. It means they're part of the team. You have this idea. Can you explain the idea a little bit more fully? Here's kind of what we're thinking. Does that, does that hit, right? Make them a stakeholder. It right. costs you nothing to make them a stakeholder. And it is such a good mentoring growth and morale uh, ability. Plus, it ensures that you're actually hitting the target. Too often, we, you know, when I see those things, it's basically you put something in a suggestion box and something comes back. And generally what comes back doesn't have anything to do with the suggestion that was put in in the beginning. Right. It often grossly misses the mark. And you've got a built-in champion at that point. So. All right, Carlos, good topic. Well, that was a great conversation looking into how to really look at policies and not only allow the product or even a vendor to drive by influencing from the bottom up, everybody should be aware of it, but policies should come from the top down. And then like Howard mentioned, that was a great example, like a yo-yo, it goes down, communicate, bring them back up. So then it's a collaborative process. So my friends, that's been awesome to see you again. Make sure that like we say every week, subscribe to our podcast, could be the audio or the video podcast, share with others. Because together, we'll be the leaders for our departments. We're going to be my friends. We'll see you on our next episode.